extend a really warm welcome to everybody who's gathered here and everybody who's joining us online. My name is Ellen Moody. I'm an associate project specialist in the collections department at the GCI, or Getty Conservation Institute. And I'm really delighted to be introducing this program. Um, it's part of the project Art in LA, which explores the practices of artists working in Los Angeles from the 1950s to the present. We'll start by acknowledging that the land that Getty inhabits today was once known as Tongavar, the home of the Gabrieleño Tongva people. We show our respects to the Gabrieleño Tongva people, as well as all First People, past, present, and future, and honor their labor as original caretakers of this land. Getty commits to building relationships with the Gabrieleño Tongva community, and we invite you to acknowledge the history of this land and join us in caring for it. This land acknowledgement is a reminder that how most of us think about LA today is the result of a, a revisionist history. And for those of us working with cultural heritage, that the values that establish museum practices and still guide them today are not universal. I think you'll hear this theme reverberate in today's program, which is about the conceptual artist Gala Porez Kim, whose work in its nuanced ways challenges those entrenched values and pushes for reflection and expansion in how we define the role of museums and their workers. These ideas will come through in the 10 minute film we're premiering momentarily, entitled Galapur's Kim, The Living Collection. This is the most recent of our artist dialogue series, films where we interview LA artists about their working methods and thoughts about the long-term preservation of their work. Usually questions about conservation are not foremost in artists' brains, but Gala is the rare exception. Not only is she extremely knowledgeable about the field of conservation and its ethics, but she also centers them in her work. Born in Bogota, Gala Porez Kim now lives and works in Los Angeles and London. She received an MA in Latin American Studies from the University of California, Los Angeles, and an MFA from the California Institute of the Arts. She's of international renown with solo exhibitions across the globe, and I'm not gonna list them all because there are so many, but just this past year, she's had solo shows at the Leon Museum of Art and Soul, at the Centro Andaluz de Arte Contemporáneo in Seville, at the Museo Universitario de Arte Contemporáneo in Mexico City, MUAC, and at the Fowler Museum here in LA. She's the recipient of numerous awards and residencies, far too many to name in the time I have today. Um, but most recently, she was the artist in residence at the Getty Research Institute from 2020 to 2022. Her work is in numerous major collections, including the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Hammer Museum, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Brooklyn Museum, the Dallas Museum of Art, and the Seoul Museum of Art. After the film, Gala will be joined in conversation by Sanchita Balachandran, the director of the Johns Hopkins Archaeological Museum and a PhD candidate at the University of Delaware. Her doctoral research is about uncovering the diverse identities of immigrants, migrants, women entrepreneurs, and enslaved peoples who are producing ceramics in ancient Athens. Sanchita received her MA in Art History and an advanced degree in conservation from the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. She is the founder and director of Untold Stories, a nonprofit organization that seeks to center the voices of black, indigenous, and people of color working in preservation of cultural heritage. Sanchita is known to many in the field as among the first to ring the bell on the long established values and biases present in our field that perpetuate inequities. Her vast pub publications and presentations on topics ranging from the use of facial reconstruction in ancient Egyptian mummies to the erroneous depiction of conservation in the Wonder Woman film do at times lay, a, lay bare uncomfortable truths. But of course, it's an awareness of these truths that allow us to move forward as a field. I'm thrilled to bring Sanchita and Gala together for this. There are many intersecting, intersecting interests and the way they both make us re-examine our assumptions via completely different means is gonna make for a really thought-provoking conversation. Um, following that conversation, we'll open it up to audience Q&A. Um, so those of you here will have microphones and those of you online, please enter your questions in the Q&A box. 
and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. And then for those of you who are here in person, please join us afterwards for a reception um, in the private dining room, which is above the Getty restaurant, just above the plaza, just across the plaza um, upstairs. Um, all right, so for now, please silence your phones and let's roll the film. Thank you. How are you? How was that, watching Ugh. yourself talk about your work? Very, very awkward. I feel like I was like, should have been already dead. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, I, I can't imagine what it's like to see myself on sort of a large screen with all these people who are here to hear from you, but... Uh, I mean, you know, it's the thing about institutions that while artists al are alive, it's an awkward negotiation with someone who's still around, and so it's more like in the future it'll feel better once I'm not here. You know what? <laughs> so here's the thing. So uh, in thinking about our conversation today, I mean, I work with archaeological materials, and the fantasy is to be able to spend even a few minutes talking with ancient makers, and I never get that. I'm always imagining what they're, they were thinking about and, you know, whether there was intention or happenstance or whatever it is. So. I was really excited to actually speak to someone who could talk about what they were thinking about. I always thought that conservators were sort of like seance people that are always trying to channel someone who's not there anymore. It's like, what were they thinking and really like embodying, you know, when, um, when a conservator is touching an object is the only person who's technically allowed to actually touch something besides the author. And so somehow thinking about the procedure as like, embodying the author itself is like possession, you know? So you're Oof. like, I'm gonna get in the body frame of whoever this ancient person was. And be I mean, I love <laughs> the idea of embodying. I think a lot of what I'm interested in is how we get to the kind of texture of what that ancient person's experience was like. Right. But, um, and, and I think many of my colleagues are, are, are well aware of my concern that we keep the touching of things to ourselves. <laughs> um, and it, I mean, that sounded really wrong the way that that just came out. Um, <laughs> keep, keep your hands to yourselves, except for in a museum collect. No, everything is coming out wrong. But I, I think one of the things that I find so powerful in holding the works of, you know, certainly ancient creators is that there is a sort of, there's something that happens from that experience of, of touching and being in connection, right? And I'm, that's why I'm just so curious about, I mean, we've selected some works that we'll be talking about together, but how, I mean, if we could go back, you said in the very beginning of this film that you're in, you know, in archives and in these sites with your, your parents who are historians and you begin to create collections of your own. Could, could you talk a little bit about that sort of origin story? Because it's, yeah, since I, you start I doing that, that very young is so interesting. Well, I think everybody has a collection all the time, you know, it's like collecting Lego piece or collecting Pokemon cards or some, even now it's like collection of nice socks. And so in a sense is thinking about how the institution really is making similar s type of decisions, but like, you know, in like the fourth dimension instead of a physical space. And so um, when I was growing up, it was essentially, was very helpful that those, those structures around collections were made clear early on. That it was like, well, everything is sort of made up. You know, there's only material that we can't actually access. And so the original functions or whatever, um, you know, time travel doesn't exist yet. And so we can only project. And so I think that looking at, um, growing up with historians is very helpful to see the impulses and projections of contemporary people in defining all the material, because it's in the end just physical um, clay or stone or something. It's just contemporary people that have made it become something else, no? Can I ask, there, you said something about how you're, you had games that you oh, played. Yeah. Can you describe one of these games? Because I think that's so interesting 
in some ways where we do sort of absurd things, right, in the name yes. of some kind of order. And I just really love the idea that it was turned into a game early on so that you could kind of yeah, play it was, with it. it. It was more like collection building as a game. So I remember, like, even in the film, there was a mosquito that bit me and it died. And so it was a victim. And so, it, it, you know, it was embedded in glue, so I could keep it forever to remember that battle. And so, in a sense, it was this type of, like, day-to-day -day things that it was like, how do you preserve something that, you know, might be day-to-day -day into the future? And so my dad actually made me do a lot of accession forms and et cetera into our uh, collections. And then, because we moved so much when I was younger, we had to deaccession works to make a smaller collection that would travel. And so it was this type of game. And so <laughs> once I actually um, started working with institutions, it was really easy to uh, s not necessarily uh, disregard the methodology of the collection, but not collection building, but more like uh, understand that it's just people behind all of those structures that exist, you know, because I think that the day-to-day -day public feels so removed from the working and of an institution that it feels like it's history, not just contemporary people like in the back that making actual decisions. Okay, so I have to ask, how did you, um, what kinds of information were you collecting and then how did you decide what to deaccession? And I think we'll talk about that in a couple mm. more slides, but how did you make those decisions as you know, the owner of the collection? Yeah, I think I think that when I look at it, I don't actually remember many of the things, and so I remember uh, from what is left because after the deaccession process, the information cataloging information got lost, and so I don't actually know the full collection anymore. Um, but what remains is just uh, just a couple of things like the mosquito, which now has taken way more weight than maybe it was at the moment of collection, just because it's the one that is left over. And there's one that is a uh, uh, mud pit, that mud on a post-it that is uh, dinosaur poo. And so it was, uh, we went to a archeological site in Colombia and it was a mud around it. And so it was just dipped in the floor and I think that that was the first artwork that it's like, who knows if this mud doesn't actually have dinosaur particles in it, you know? And so it has like a cataloging, et cetera. I love it, I love it. Um, well, since we have limited time, though I could ask you many questions and these people want to leave at some point, um, but not yet. Uh, maybe we could start by talking about this work that's been in, um, all of the sort of publicity and is, has this really enigmatic title. So could you start by telling us about the title and how this work is made? Yes, so um, I was making a work with the British Museum and I was trying to find various living things in a collection, whether it was like a spirit or mold or any type of living thing. And so I uh, made this work, which was part of a larger body of work that is about how things leave a collection, not through a deaccession policy. And so I actually um, collected some mold spores from the storage. Um, and then uh, the, because the, in theory, I thought that the mold, not in theory, in actual life, the mold eats the collection, and so it's constituted out of the physical collection, and then by propagating it outside, we can actually see the collection itself growing in a new way. And so the works um, here is uh, the first time I made it that is, I mean, this is the moment when it was cute, and then it becomes really, really extra. Um, <laughs> and so throughout the duration of the exhibition, you can see a kind of a, cycle of mold growing. And so the title was, out of an instance of expiration comes a perennial showing. And so I thought that the moment of expiration was when someone in the institution thought that something had died. And then the perennial showing was like this sort of plant thing where the collection would 
be alive and growing every time that this work gets remade. You know? And so, at, for example, the current version that is at the National Museum in Korea, it has similar colors, but it's like looking like really abstract painting looking. And Can you talk, we were, I was asking you how this, this perennial showing comes to be. Can you talk a little bit about the process of how you reproduce, or yes. not reproduce, propagate this work elsewhere? Yes, and so I have the original spores in my studio, and I have a, a biologist friend who helped me technically figure out how to make mold grow. And so I'm like, I don't know how to make mold grow. I'm like, leave it out or whatever. But, um, and so technically it's made uh, with potato dextrose agar on a uh, fabric sheet and then the spores that I basically ship from my studio into the venue that is showing it opens the Ziploc and we rub the fabric over it and then two days later they start growing. And so it, I think that the most difficult part always has been that uh, a conservator in the museum is like, how do we show this mold in the room? <laughs> and so it, it, it has, it's made with a full like waterproof um, plastic thing that wraps around the vitrine and the channel in the bottom, that silver channel is holding water. And so it's a little environment inside. So I was really struck by your comment in the film that um, some of your work is in response to the anxieties of other people, and it seems like this is definitely one of those conservator <laughs> anxieties. Yes, yes. Um, and I'm just curious because, uh, in some ways, I feel like conservators have often been turned into the no people, you know, in institutions. Like, no, we can't do that. How are we going to show this mold piece? How do we have to kind of encapsulate it? And I guess. Um, a lot of that is about control because so many things in collections are out of control and one worries about the, I, I guess, the heavy weight of responsibility, right? That we, we are sort of stuck with making sure things survive for future people. And forever. So, oh, forever. I mean, it's... Like, how? <laughs> and, and I feel like in some ways you're really kind of picking up the fact that we're encountering these existential questions and we're dealing with things that we we can't actually solve, I mean, as, as humans, let alone as specialized, you know, pr professionals. But I'm curious, um, could we think about conservation as a non-anxious profession? I mean, I think what you do really well with your work is you show, you reflect back the kinds of things that you see that is hard for us to see when we're in it day to day, saying, oh, we don't want mold, humidity, you know, go through the list. Um, the 10 agents of deterioration for any conservators in the room. Um, I know we apparently only have 10, which seems to me far too small a list. Um, so I'm curious, you know, when you're asking conservators to actively participate yes. in, the, in the perennial showing of something that we claim we're scared about, um, is there a way to think beyond anxiety? Is there a non-anxious conservation that you could kind of lead us towards? Yeah, I think it's, you know, the anxiety is coming from having to be in opposition to a natural process of decay. And so, you know, there's, I've gotten letters from collections managers saying like, we are standard, like best practices, whatever, we have no dust in the storage. And so I'm like, okay, just put a tape upside down <laughs> and then see, it's just, uh, I think that the, 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 acceptance of nature in day-to-day, -day, you know, and the process of decay that is inevitably happening, um, and instead of um, keeping something indefinitely, it's more like you're just controlling that rate of decay, whether you want it to go faster or slower is going to happen anyway, um, becomes easier to uh, kind of let go of the responsibility that you essentially inherit from past people who have decided that these are the things that we should keep. Because the mosquito, for example. Exactly, like somebody, this, once I die, somebody <laughs> is gonna have to maintain that mosquito and be like, why this one and not the current mosquito that is destroying my life, you know? And so, in a sense, it's just the, I don't know, something about the, the realistic looking at material things and decay and the reasons why people are 
spending so much energy preserving, not preserving, but like you said, controlling an environment that is almost incontrollable when you look at the cellular level. Because I think that some, some of the questions uh, that I think about is having to do with practicality, where it's like there is a practical border to things before we start looking at every dust particle or every mold spore or every moisture drop that is in every room. And so to some degree, there is an actual border. Well, can I ask before we move maybe to the next one since I have no sense of time, um, what do you wish for your own works? Because I think it's, it's one thing if you're conserving the works that have been handed down and it, they come with this tremendous responsibility. And again, I, I work with people who can't tell me the answers to questions like, well, what, what do you hope for your own works considering that some of these are such ephemeral materials, right, and are meant to actually change and decay? Right. I think that, you know, because I make so many different types of works, they have different conservation requirements. There are some that, like, exist as straight up drawing, paper, conservator thing. But, uh, for example, the, the works that are about leaving a museum uh, cannot go back into a museum the same way. And so they have different specific conservation and registration notes that come with it. And so because I haven't thoroughly... Um, written out those things, I actually still have them, which actually makes me really anxious because I'm like, if I die tomorrow, are they gonna end up at the thrift store because they're not in the deep vault of some institution that is collecting the like art looking ones, no, that uh, circulate regularly, no? And so I think that maybe, uh, for example, with this work, um, which was, which is a drawing, uh, one of six drawings of the fabric fragments, fabric fragments that were, um, dredged from the sacred Tenotia Chichen Itza, these are actually carbonized fabrics because they were burnt before they entered the cenote. And then as the film explained, a conservator in uh, the 1900s attached glue to the billion particles of ash to keep the shape of this fabric. And so when I drew it, I actually was just making a catalog work to be like, okay, if it, you know we're, cataloging what a uh, fragment is, and if the, like a little piece breaks, then you have another cataloging number, and so it's infinite, because should you catalog every single particle? That would be a TMS problem. But, um, but I think that when, you know, MoMA collected this work, this set of six, there was an interview with a conservator, and I was actually thinking about how it would circulate or be kept as my own new object. And so uh, I think that when they asked me what you want to do with this, uh, if it uh, something happens to it, then I thought that a future conservator could just redraw the whole thing because then it would mirror the original conservator who laid out this carbon particles in the shape of a fabric. And so it would be a work for the future conservator to actually realize in a way that I, as an artist, can't actually do today. Because okay, every conservator listening to that just kind of panicked when you said that, because <laughs> so, mu so much of our training is that we, we remain quite separate from the hand of the artist, right? And, and obviously you're really pushing that boundary as to where the hand of ancient and contemporary and future artist or conservator might be. Yeah, because I think, you know, when I was thinking about the conservator whose job was to put the original glue onto these particles, they're actually deciding so many author level things. They're making a sculpture essentially out of these particles that are not a fabric anymore. And so, you know, it was one of those, there's so many instances in which the process of conservation is actually generating a new object and a new decision that is author level. And so um, that's sort of the conversations that I have with a lot of conservators who don't want to be like, I'm also making author level choices because we are scientists only. And I'm like, really? Well, can I ask though? I mean, so yeah, I think, I think most of us who intervene or even if we don't intervene on works, uh, I mean, we're always intervening, whatever we do, I think. Um, we do make, I mean, if you want to call it author level interventions, and I'm curious, I mean, you're really interested in the transparency that institutions should bring to the works they hold, 
And I, I'm just wondering, you know, thinking about the sort of future moment, what could transparency on a museum label look like, for example? I think what I really like about your work is you surface the kinds of interventions that people do, like conservators, who, who usually don't get that, who, who often don't want that work either known publicly or are not invited to kind of put their name on it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to me, there's a real kind of poignancy and care in, in the way that you're surfacing that, that labor, that intervention, and that care work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think essentially we would think of ourselves, I think, as very much carers. So I'm curious, would, it, would a future label that's fully transparent include the names of all of the people, you know, conserved right. by so-and-so in this year, glued with this? Um, is that something, is that a way of getting at that? Well, I think that it doesn't necessarily would fit in the label, but I we think- We can make a label bigger, <laughs> but, but I think that because in the end is it's not necessarily full author label because you are not choosing the original idea. You're like basically collaborating with an existing author. And so in a sense, it's thinking about potentially with some, it's thinking about like a bibliography or something where somewhere you can actually find what the, what actually constitutes the object that we have in front of us. It's not only like, a singular person, and it's not necessarily that it has to be like specifically authored or something, but it's more like to understand that it's a relay of not a singular original author, because I think that that's the thing with, at least with many contemporary artworks, that it's like n you are never really aware of how the technically that object is made. And so I think that, of course, if uh, artwork is made to be like the author's hand needs to be the thing that informs and uh, is what that work is about, it's a different story. But when, you know, for example, for me, so many people intervene in the making, original making of this drawing that a future one, if they can render generally, is no problem. You know, it's not, no different than we as a studio doing it the first time around. Uh, but I think that it's understanding, differentiating between the uh, range of, uh, available interventions that someone in the future can do. And then, for example, I'm thinking about like Rothko painting, which is like specifically made to have a specific hue. And so when someone has to clean it, they're deciding when to stop cleaning it and when the color stops being darker and lighter or whatever. And I'm like, that's what that painting is about. It essentially has to be about the hue, decision of the hue. And a conservator is doing that when they clean it. And so how do you even author that? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think these are really challenging questions that um, in some ways, you know, you're again, surfacing this kind of thing that we almost take for granted. I mean, we're making these decisions on a day-to-day -day basis and an object-to-object -object basis, obviously when in conversations with people, but yeah, ultimately it is our hand that makes that choice. Even if you're not even wanting to make it, you have to make it. Like for example, with fabric fragments, if they're laid out in a specific pattern, it's already a formal choice. So even mm -hmm. by laying it down, it's already like, now is a new object. And so yeah. <laughs> there's no escaping. I mean, I think it is sometimes a kind of paralyzing sort of responsibility, right? And uh, I mean, I, I, wanna, I wanna stay on this piece for a second because I know you've done multiple interventions with these um, these fragments, but I'm so curious about the choice of the drawing because uh, I work on ancient drawing and and I was a little bit devastated in the, in the film where you say you're not that attached to your mark, and and it just it just makes me you know so horrified because I, I as a, a conservator am very attached to those marks right for me that's why I do what I do to see that intervention of the artist on a surface. And so I'm curious how you how you think about, because all of this is your mark, right? But okay, so, so what question. should we pay attention With to? With the ancient marks, would it be like a difference between an ancient author or an ancient author assistant? 
would that be like? I mean, I, I, <laughs> I wish I would love to be in, this is the thing, could I be in the studio and see who's there? But ultimately, we have so little left, similar to your deaccessioned, only the mosquito and dinosaur poop are left. Right. When you have so little, part of it is having to imagine who's present, right? And who can we still be in, in communication with through But I these think, bits. I don't think it goes down to a singular person. It's no. more like a, a collective you who made this work. It doesn't have to be one author. That's kind of what uh, it is because whether it's like this single ancient person or their cousin who just happened to help or whatever, yeah. it doesn't make a difference really at this point because we don't know. Their kid and stuck so, their hand in it. At the yeah, and time. so it's just, I think that then it becomes like a t thing about the time. You know, the context in which this was made is not attached to a singular person. And so for me, I love drawing, but it's not necessarily that it has to be my, you know, whether I drew it or someone else helped me draw it makes no difference to me in the structure of how this specific work functions, you know, because it is about just carbon particles on top of a paper. And so whether I put them there or uh, my assistant helps me put it there is okay. But what I thought would be important was that if a future conservator lays it down, then it would be different than my own mark hmm. uh, because of the source of the original image, which is the next slide. If we show it, then you can see, yeah. And so that's a bunch of carbon particles glued together to look like this fabric. Um, can you tell me what you love about drawing? It takes a lot of patience that I don't have. And so I think that I'm like, if I can anticipate uh, the time it takes to look at something for that close, it really helps to frame the time I will spend trying to understand it. And so I'm like, what process takes longer than drawing <laughs> to make it even longer, you know? Um, because I was thinking like, why, would it not be just photographs, you know, like simple, or like it's still functioning. But I do think that, as I said, maybe many of the works that are drawn are for the maker and the time that is spent with a subject. And then the audience actually sees the result of that interaction. And um, yeah, I think that when I, when I go see people looking at my work, it's you feel the sense of time because people are like, oh my God, that must have taken forever. <laughs> you know, be before you actually get into what that work was, you know, and so it's, it does um, slow down things. Also because it's so much easier to make faster things now, you know. Well, and I think that that's something I really enjoyed about looking at your work, that you do get, again, that sense of care, the, the, the close attention, just allowing the work or the ancient object to kind of unfold and getting to know, you know, these individual fibers. And to me, that seems very akin to what conservators do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Allowing kind of th things to unfold so that we have a better grasp of what they were meant to do in the world. And I, and I guess, what do you think about time? It seems like in some ways you're manipulating time as, a, as an artistic medium, maybe all artworks are really time-based media. Um, but I mean, how, how do you think about um, how, how we should understand time and its impact on the kinds of works that you produce? Um, I think that, not that I'm thinking about uh, the specific time of my work, that's just sort of the production thing, but in terms of a subject, I think that we were talking about it earlier about how in historical collections, time is the main material, where it's like, okay, this is super ancient or like contemporary or something before you actually get into whatever that object might have been. And so whether it's like uh, a recent stone carving versus uh, ancient stone carving, I'm like, the rock is still really, really, really old. It's just how old is the intervention uh, by a person into it, no? And so, so much of the value that we give collections or historical material has to do with a fourth dimensional material. Okay, we're getting the five minutes, so let's at least talk a little bit about this other piece that you've selected. Um, can you tell us about the next piece, which uh, 
and the title and how this was made, which I found fascinating, and I promise you, if you'd explain it, people will find really fascinating. Okay, so this is uh, leaving the institution through cremation is easier than as a result of the accession policy. It's a work that was made after the fire in the Rio Museum that uh, held Lu Lucia, the oldest mummy in the Americas. And so I actually uh, read a newspaper article that s celebrated the fact that they, after the fire, they had uh, recovered 80% of the body fragments of Lucia, this mummy, and they were trying to put it back together. And so I thought about the 20% that escaped through this fire because there is no deaccession policy, essentially. Uh, and, and so that this person through this fire was able to escape uh, the taxonomy of a historical object and become a cadaver category again. And so the work physically is a napkin with ash that was collected after the fire and uh, comes with a letter to the director of the museum essentially proposing that the 80% that remains, maybe we can burn it to uh, let it join the other 20% that was able to leave. Did you ever get a response to that letter? Yeah. Did you send it? <laughs> yes, I sent all the letters. And so something, so for example, this is a work that I still have because I'm like, Lucia can't go back into a contemporary museum as an art shape now. And so, um, you know, I was thinking about um, how the future of this work might be and it would be that it would have to be accessioned into a collection as a cemetery. And so one of the things that I said in the film at the end was that, you know, the things that the box holds inside actually changes the function of the container as well. And so if Lucia is a person and a cadaver essentially, what is the place where cadavers go as a cemetery? And so by just having it accessioned, then it would be a cemetery, and so it would turn a conservator into a coroner or something like that. So how does it ripple down into the jobs of uh, people who care for that material? No? I mean, I really love this piece because I have actually spent a lot of time both in ancient cemeteries and in contemporary cemeteries in a sense because of, I've cared for mummified people in mm -hmm. them, and I do think a lot about what, what would they have wanted? I mean, clearly this was not the place where they or their loved ones would have envisioned like, them this going. is not body worlds. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, this, is, this is not what they wanted, yeah. right? And so to me, this work really is it's very poignant to think about what an escape from an institutional frame might look like. But I think it's, uh, maybe it doesn't necessarily have to be an escape, physical escape. Uh, but more uh, taxonomy escape. And so is escaping the frame of uh, categorization as just historical, because it's not just historical. It was something else before it was historical. And so uh, uh, one of the things that I'm thinking about is how to have a catalog that has multiple taxonomies that exist and you can uh, shift between them because, you know, as an object gets older and older, it just really changes. It, it adds new categorizations, but doesn't mean that it leaves any of them behind. And so it's like, yes, Lucia, Lucia, it was a person, and then it was a cadaver, and then it was uh, archaeology, and then it was a contemporary work. And so it just keeps adding on, but doesn't delete any of the previous ones. And so how how to leave uh, a, a museum is not necessarily about a physical leaving, but a category leaving. Because we can just say like the museum is a cemetery and then that's where it would go naturally, you know? Well, so before we uh, open it up for other people to ask questions, and you know, I'm sure they have many, uh, what does this do then for the role of the conservator who is caretaker part Coroner, part, uh, you it's know, all of the above, it's right? All of so, the, yep. so how do we? I don't know. How how could you envision a sort of future trained professional, or whether um, it's even a trained professional who would do all of the roles required to? I think nimble some of these responsibilities? and nimble and 
collaborative in a way because there is already someone who is doing that conservation job in whatever other categorization needs might be. And so in a sense could be like a producer instead. So an organizer of different types of care, but not necessarily that you have to know all of the above because each individual, I mean, in a encyclopedic museum is gonna be so many different types of functions that exist, it's like infinite almost. So there's no way to be able to know all of them, but someone already knows it somewhere else. And so it's just being able to integrate some of those um, other people. And, and essentially it's like many of the works in a collection are actually functioning like artworks in the regular zone. It's more thinking about the, the section of the collection that someone in the ancient past thought that it would have a function that would go on forever. And so like a, you know, something that's supposed to go on forever in the past is still happening today. So what are the parts that we're not uh, taking into account for? Thank you so much. And I think we should take questions from the audience. Is this piece, or are any of your other archeological pieces signed and dated? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why not? Um, define what signed and dated is, because the information is attached to the work in my own catalog, but not on the physical object. Because it's like going to be my name on it. This makes no sense. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's like, it's a, uh, it's supposed to be a funerary urn with cremains, and so to put my name on it will be like, why is this a part of the picture plane? You know. And so I think that when I, by putting my signature on it, by default, it becomes part of the physical image, and it's not. Maybe the back, but I'm like. Mm. If, 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 it w if there was no technology to keep track of the cataloging of my own work, it might be different, but there's a internet. <laughs> um, we have a question online from Lori Wong. She says, thank you, Gala and Sanchita, great talk. In addition to how conservators add the history of an object through treatments, add to the history of an object through treatments. What are your thoughts as an artist and conservator on conservation research into artist materials, such as what happens at the Getty Conservation Institute that impacts the understanding and interpretation of material choices used by artists in the past and even influences material choices, hang on, used by artists working today? How does this further change our idea of the role of the conservator? Ooh, fun. So now that I'm teaching sculpture, I'm on the front end of production, and so it's thinking about how students are not thinking about what a future conservator is gonna have to deal with. And so I actually think that it depends what the function of a work is, you know, if, if, if the material itself and the author hand of production is the actual meaning of this work, it becomes more difficult. But if it's secondary, then I actually think that conservators are actually now technically better trained than contemporary artists, 100%, because we don't have any, at least I didn't have any like technical training at all in school, and so when thinking about my own works, even earlier on, I was like, I hope it falls apart so a conservator can make it better, you know? <laughs> they know what kind of glue to use from the beginning. <laughs> you know? And so I think that it's, it's again, uh, thinking about what is essential to the idea that that object is making, no? Um. I mean, as a conservator, I'm always terrified of changing or in some ways influencing the curiosity of the contemporary artist by saying, oh, well, you know, that material's really 
kind of terrible, it's going to fall apart. And, and, I, and some of my biggest arguments with contemporary practitioners have been, well, you didn't tell me that was going to do that, or why did you tell me that? Now I don't feel like using it um, because I'm worried about it. And so one of the practices that you've alluded to, I mean, when things come into collections, right, there's always the the list of things that you as the artist have to fill out, like how do you want yes. this to be preserved? What What is important to save? Does that kind of documentation freak you out? Do you mm. do you want it? What What does it? Yeah, I th I think that it's it just again depends on the necessity of the actual material. Like it has to be this specific ink because it was like the last drop of blood or blah blah blah. It has to be that specific one. You cannot replace it. But if it's just like red mark on something that it could be any red mark, no problem, you know. And so I think it's understanding that all, not all works or not even flat works or painting anything is uh, attached to the preciousness of uh, original material um, and that it could be, again, thinking about like conceptual works is easier because it's like it could be remade every time, you know, an artist could, artist proof or exhibition copy or any of these things that you need just a physical shape to install that work in someone's head. Uh, but the thing itself is like a nice pedestal for the idea. Oh man, this is, I would love to talk to some ancient makers about this. <laughs> yeah, but ancient people is different. You know, like a, but what if know. at the end of all this, Gala, you only have one of those left and, you know? Yeah, but uh, you have to like watch hoarders. It's like a thing where it's like, do we actually we have to? We are professional hoarders. We're at a museum. I know, I know. But that's why I really love talking to conservators and registrars because when you think about it in the day to day, it's like I have too many things in my closet, and so why can't I just get rid of this like last T-shirt of like whatever, you know? And so it becomes not necessarily about the actual object, but something else. That is not that you're throwing away the last specific thing because it might be irrelevant right now, but it's more like throwing away the amount of uh, generations of people before who have taken care of that work uh, as if it was like the most important thing ever. And so in a sense, it's not about that object anymore. Um, uh, and so, Again, I think that is a very difficult job because every object has its own specific um, requirements and different materials and different um, motivations for being made, no? So thank you both. Um, this feels like a silly question, but um, I really like the discussion of drawing and collaboration and um, kind of just I'm wondering, Gal, about your the process of making and whether you <clears throat> ever erase things and what your kind of thoughts are if you erase. And this is partly inspired by the, the conversation you both had about the label and including every single action that is made on this. And also I know Sanchita has this pot where there's like curls on someone on, who's wearing a helmet, but then that is taken off of the final piece. So we have like this record of erasure but do you keep records of erasure? Do you think about it before you change something? Or like, can you tell us a little bit more about your process? Yes, I do erase things, but I think that that's a, uh, I don't keep track of all of the erase parts because I don't necessarily think it's all of the steps are important to me until the piece is finished. Why? I didn't think about that before, but, um, but I do think about, uh, for example, that, uh, what is that, MoMA Red, Red Studio video that was online during COVID, you know, they stared at that painting forever. And so I actually had never seen that painting in person before. And the first time I saw it was upskirt way, like inside guts first. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, I will never be able to see the actual painting, how the author wanted it to be seen, because I know that there's all of these things underneath it that are more interesting than the actual picture. And so in a sense, it was thinking about uh, artist's intention for a work versus art historian intention for a work because the learning about the making of a work is very interesting already, but we can share space with author intention as well, no? And so in a sense is thinking about uh, in, 
you know, because I was thinking like, I would love, I love conservation videos like that, but I was thinking like in the gallery, would I want somebody to actually see all of the erased ones first? But I'm like, well, this work is not about erasing anyway, you know, and if I make, uh, if it has more or less pigment on it, it doesn't matter. And so, um, but it was, it was something that I thought during that painting that I'm like, if I ever see it in person, I will not be able to unsee the first time I understood it, guts first. That's your next show, guts first. Yeah. No. <laughs> A conservation show about guts. Hey, it's an amazing material. Do you suppose that conservators are afraid of death and why they can't let things go? Like objects have life. If we think about an nature, as nature has a cycle, things live, die, they're reborn in different ways. What is it about the obsession to make inert and static still preserved forever, this particular object? What is, do you think that there's some sort of connection to loss or fear of loss, fear of death, that, that makes it impossible to go from, you know, leaving the institution through cremation or an object versus an object who leaves through fire, <laughs> who leaves through destruction that's uncontrolled, uncontrollable? I think that once the object entered a collection as a historical object, it was dead to begin with. And so, because it stopped being seen as whatever is other thing that was happening before. And so I think I wouldn't be able to say if conservators are scared of death. Are you scared of death? Um, <laughs> wow, I did not realize this but, is the turn this was gonna take. <laughs> but, but I think that But I think that with looted objects, it brings the container with it as well. And so when I think about, you know, even with the cenote, I was thinking like, by moving one thing from one place to the other, the institution itself has become a cenote. And so it's just being able to recognize that it doesn't happen only one way where information gets deleted, but by bringing an object like that into a container, it brings all of its baggage with it and its context, etc. And so I was thinking like, well, it's by putting those objects into a, in the Peabody, the Peabody actually became the sacred pit of Chalk, the rain god, and it needs to get rained on. And so it's just how it just can be seen multifunction. Way, but back to the question of death, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. On some level, are we all not concerned about our mortality? I, I, it just seems like a human question in some ways. You have to think about it at some point. But I think this is where, as a conservator, it's a, it's a daily practice to confront the kind of decay and end of things in, in their physical form, certainly, and also being aware that they are no longer working in the original context in which they were intended to appear and be interacted with. So for me, I think of it as a kind of constant reminder, right? That there is, there is loss um, and some of that can never be resolved. But I don't know, the reason why I love this, this work is that you still have the ability to reconnect with, with something real and someone real through this you know, in my case, physical material because we don't have other ways necessarily to connect so closely. And for me, that's deeply reassuring, but I'm also aware of how, um, how privileged that is, right? It gives me the opportunity to do that, but not others. And I think that's where, in some ways, our, our field really needs to think about how we've, we've kept that to ourselves and it does us. And I think just 
these works a terrible disservice. So for me, a lot of what I'm curious about with your work is having sort of shown us, in some ways, the arbitrary decisions that we, we make as institutions and, and workers within institutions. How can we open up some of these possibilities for everyone's betterment? Well, I also think it's interesting that you call it loss because I think it's, uh, for example, it's like if the natural process, you know, trajectory of something is to like fragment and then go back into becoming something, then wouldn't keeping it preserved actually be in disservice to the next audience that is supposed to see these materials? So for example, by keeping something that is supposed to decay from decaying, are you actually keeping that material from the warm audience that is supposed to be the next uh, intended viewer of that material? And so, loss for whom is the question, like loss for our own specific category because it's not that it's leaving, it's just changing shapes into another thing that is meant for other things that are not how we use them as cultural things in the box or something. Um, another question um, online, this one from Ruth Del Fresno Guillem. Um, you are talking about the author is not attached to the hand that made the artwork, um, but when we have to preserve and decide the prof process, should we conservators ask you, the author, um, or do you include other people in the conversation? I understand that you are the creator, um, as you are the one who conceived it. Would author and decisions be based on conception? Hmm. I th yes. I. I I do think that a lot of, that's why a lot of these um, accession conservation uh, interviews are really stressful because you have to anticipate what 100 years in the future someone might do. And so uh, it's just trying to be like, best case scenario, what are the essential things about this material that are, that I want to keep? And so, because then I'm thinking like, you know, practically thinking if, Kleenex stops making tissue, then would this piece need to be in a tissue or can it be just like a piece of paper or another thing? And so for a future conservator to be like, we can't actually preserve this work because we don't have Kleenex available anymore. I'll be like, but that doesn't matter. Like use like a fabric, whatever, you know? And so there are essential materials and not essential materials. And so I think that as author maker, people, artists should also understand what are the parts about your work that is important to keep um, and if it has to be that specific material and why. I have one um, final question. It's not really a question, it's a comment from our online audience. This is from Kate Smith. She says, I hope that we as conservators can transform our anxieties into inspiration and collaboration when faced with these incredible puzzles of responsibility. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please join us across the plaza at the above the restaurant for a glass of wine. <laughs>